So in the last PowerPoint, we learned a lot about pharmacodynamics in addition to a lot of other things. Uh, now I want to tell you a little bit about pharmacokinetics. So I want you to know about what pharmacokinetics is, the blood brain barrier. Uh, I want you to be able to identify all mechanisms of drug administration covered in this uh, presentation and how they would influence pharmacokinetics, uh, particularly uh, the speed of onset. Uh, and I would like you to compare and contrast mechanistically how the following drug classes produce their effects, uptake inhibitors, postsynaptic receptors, agonists, and enzyme inhibitors. So I wanted to just start with a thought question here. Uh, you know, I, I don't really want an answer, but uh, you know, based on your knowledge of pyrolysis, pharmacokinetics, routes of administration, and bioavailability, if a relative came to you asking about using cannabis during chemotherapy, what would you tell them regarding the use of PO, that means oral, per os, Marinol, which would be THC alone, oral, an oral broad spectrum, uh, spectrum tincture of cannabis, which would be THC and all extracted cannabinoids, smoked, a smoked cannabis joint, uh, all cannabinoids and those produced through pyrolysis. So I mean, like, what would you tell them about the time course, the half-life, maximal effects, duration of onset and offset? all of which might inform their decision making. I mean, like some people uh, in particular might want like a more short-lived relief that might not interfere with their interaction with their family, amongst other things. Um, you know, others might want you know, just a maximal effect just because the pain or the, the discomfort is so severe. So, I mean, these are the sorts of considerations that uh, one might want to make, take into account when considering the medicinal use of uh, cannabis. Pharmacokinetics refers to factors that affect the movement of a drug through the body. Uh, essentially, you know, it helps determine bioavailability. However, there's also this thing about the blood-brain barrier. So, I mean, like what you see in plasma might not reflect what actually enters into the brain. In fact, one might say or argue that the blood-brain barrier is really the bane of the psychopharmacologist. I mean, there, there are many, many drugs that are out there you know, that could be quite effective at treating a variety of, of psychiatric disorders. But they don't pass the blood-brain barrier, so how do you get them into the brain? You know, I mean, in rat studies, we can drill holes through there and just squirt them in. <laughs> a little more complicated than that. But, uh, you know, in a human, what are you going to do uh, if you cannot get past the blood-brain barrier? So the blood-brain barrier is formed of tight junctions within the central nervous system that prevent the movement of large molecules like drugs, uh, which can drastically limit drug availability in the brain, even if you see it in the blood. One key concept in pharmacokinetics is route of administration. And again, this is very much related to bioavailability. So if you took a drug intravenously, uh, you, know, you would maximize bioavailability and you would eliminate what's known as lag time. You, you get almost instantaneous effects, especially if the drug passes the blood-brain barrier in the case of a psychoactive drug. Uh, you know, uh, then smoking uh, you know, would be one of the additional like very fast methods to get there, and that's because there are capillary beds that interact with the alveoli, or like you know, the, the very fine uh, you know, output of the respiratory system, the you know, bronchi, bronchioles, alveoli, <clears throat> would hit the capillary bed very quickly without you know, necessarily going through the liver. However, if you take something orally, you know, it's gonna go through the entire gut, and then through the intestines, and then through the liver, whereas some of it's gonna be broken down approximately half. Uh, if it's under first order kinetics, uh, before it enters into the, uh, uh, in large amounts, into the blood through the hepatic portal system. And then I, I would like to add that, you know, so a lot, some uh, amount of drug, uh, really uh, a lot depending on the ion, uh, ion form uh, of the actual drug uh, is going to enter into the blood at the level of the stomach or in the intestine, really depending on uh, you know, the, uh, you know, ionic uh, conformation and the pH, uh, you know, uh, of the local environment and how the two interact. 
but still, you know, a lot would pass through the liver first and enter through the hepatic portal vein. Um, you know, so uh, this is a table from your book uh, detailing the relationship between routes of administration and how that would influence the effects of the drug. You know, again, like tablets, syrups, things that you would take orally, uh, you know, we're going to have a slow to moderate speed of onset, whereas if you inhale or uh, inject, uh, that would be a more moderate to fast effect due to the capillary beds around the alveoli. Uh, a peripheral injection, subcutaneous, that would be right under the skin, known as skin popping. Intramuscular, like into the, the muscle. Uh, you know, depending on this, you can actually also enter the blood without going through the GI, or uh, gastrointestinal system and liver first. Uh, so it could still be, you know, moderate to fast relative to ingestion. Uh, you know, and then central injection, uh, you know, this would be directly into the IAV uh, line. In some cases, intrathecally, uh, you know, this would be done more in terms of uh, chronic pain, uh, spinal issues where you would actually give the, uh, uh, typically like a spinal tap uh, that would allow uh, treatment uh, really directly into the uh, CNS. And this would have to do with issue, you would want to do this with issue uh, drugs that do not uh, that pass through certain barriers. So it's a way of, uh, you know, circumventing or overcoming uh, the blood brain barrier. Here is, are several bioavailability curves uh, showing uh, drug in the blood or cocaine in the blood or plasma. Uh, following different routes of administration. As you can see, if you took cocaine intravenously, you know, you're going to see almost an instantaneous effect and, uh, you know, with, with very limited uh, lag time, uh, you know, there's some debate as to whether or not that occurs within five seconds or 20 seconds, uh, you know, but it, but it is incredibly rapid. Uh, you would also see a higher maximal concentration or Cmax uh, because there's not going to be any, uh, you know, metabolism before it enters into the blood. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's not going to be any off-site binding or the, the, the drug getting caught up in fat and other things that could, uh, you know, or uh, it binding to other proteins or these sorts of things that it, uh, might delay it, uh, state uh, onset in the plasma. Uh, smoking would be uh, the next fastest and uh, you know also note that the uh, doses aren't uh, perfectly matched here which I mean like it's very difficult to do uh, when you're altering routes of administration uh, you there there uh, you know complex modeling uh, equations that exist uh, that you can use to get at this but uh, you know at some level it's not a perfect science when you're altering route of administration and then trying to determine uh, what would be the uh, proper dose. But the, the take home here is that smoking is also, you know, very fast onset. Uh, by contrast, if you snorted the cocaine, you know, you would still get a pretty rapid uh, rate of onset, but it would be a little slower than if you smoked it or if you smoked crack, for example. Crack is also more lipophilic uh, than cocaine, meaning that it's going to pass through plasma membranes faster. Uh, that's one of the tricks of uh, what is crack and what was freebasing. I mean, that, that's really the trick. In addition to, to smoking, which is going to cause faster onset, that also makes the drug more uh, easily to pass through plasma membranes. And then the oral route would be one of the slower routes, uh, you know, and this is going to cause, uh, you know, more of a delayed onset and also probably reduce the maximal plasma uh, level that you can achieve. So we've already learned a little bit about, you know, receptor agonists and antagonists, but there are way, other ways that drugs can influence neurotransmission. And I, I just wanted to go over a couple more here. So some drugs, like cocaine, affect how long transmitters remain in the uh, synapse, affecting transmitter reuptake. They interfere or block the transporter, which are specialized proteins that return transmitter to the presynaptic re, uh, membrane for recycling. Recall that these typically exist along the periphery of the synaptic cleft. 
Um, and uh, for example, cocaine would block that from occurring, so the synaptic cleft becomes flooded with dopamine uh, in one case. And uh, so that would mean that dopamine is having a prolonged effect at the postsynaptic receptor, uh, which you, know, you could also say cocaine is an indirect agonist because it is uh, you know, leading to increased postsynaptic activation indirectly by blocking its uptake and flooding the synaptic cleft. Here's the cartoon from your book showing this occurring. Uh, you know, typically, uh, under typical conditions, the dopamine neurotransmitter would be released from these vesicular stores, and they would then bind at dopamine receptors along the uh, postsynaptic uh, neuron. And uh, you know, what you see on the sides there in particular are the dopamine transporters, which would then take up the extra uh, dopamine really within a, you know, just a, a matter of seconds. Uh, to then be recycled back into vesicles and reused. However, when cocaine is on board, it blocks the dopamine transporter from reuptaking the uh, dopamine, and what you see is the synaptic cleft being flooded. So rather than uh, seeing the dopamine uh, amount or concentration uh, decay in a matter of seconds, uh, you know, you, you might see prolonged activation. Uh, at the postsynaptic receptor. Some drugs may also interfere with uh, degradation or the breakdown of neurotransmitters, causing the neurotransmitters to have lasting effects. One famous example is cholinesterase inhibitors, which inhibit the breakdown of acetylcholine at the synapse by uh, uh, preventing the enzyme acetylcholinesterase from breaking down acetylcholine causing prolonged muscle contraction. So, uh, you know, this happens with mustard gas or sarin, and, you know, it, it can be uh, countered, uh, you, know, uh, you know, pharmacologically, uh, you know, the, such drugs would be given to special ops uh, forces. Uh, so that should uh, automatically counter some of the, uh, you know, uh, mus uh, muscular, neuromuscular uh, junction issues. Uh, one interesting fact with uh, sarin and mustard gas is that uh, due to changes in their, due to their density, they tend to uh, lie low on the ground. So, I mean, if you do ever find yourself in a uh, chemical warfare attack or terrorist attack, and, uh, you know, again, I, I, like, I, I think that it is much more likely that, it, uh, uh, you know, a, a just a, a rogue terrorist group would probably be able to develop mustard gas much more easily than a biological weapon. So the, the chemical warfare agents, I, I think, uh, well, you, you see them uh, much more frequently being used in, uh, you know, uh, through militia groups and these sorts of things than you would ever hear of a biological warfare being successfully used. But, uh, you know, one thing to note is if you ever are around an attack, the gases, especially mustard and sarin, because of their density, they lie low to the ground. So, you know, one of your, I think, first instincts would be to hit the ground and try to stay low and out of sight. That is the opposite of what you want to do because the gas is going to, uh, you know, stay low. So what you want to do is seek high ground. You want to go upstairs. You want to go on the roof, assuming nobody's shooting at you, of course. But, I mean, like, you, you want to go up. Uh, because the gas is going to go down. And this should just be reviewed for you at this point, but just in a very straightforward. But postsynaptic receptors can either be blocked or activated by drugs that would then again be mimicking endogenous chemicals or blocking them. Uh, prolonged transmitter receptor activity can alter behavior in profound ways. And again, this is going to occur in an effect dependent manner rather than the entire body or system changing. Uh, and tolerance or sensitization, reverse tolerance, can occur, uh, you know, in different time courses to specific effects. So here's a cartoon from your book that, I mean, there, there are really some fascinating things in here, if you look at it, of uh, different uh, ligands binding to postsynaptic receptors. Uh, you know, this guy is really a party animal. They have several things on board here at once. 
But, uh, you know, nicotine can act on, uh, you know, uh, in addition to muscarinic receptors, nicotinic ion channels uh, to cause an immediate influx of ions into the postsynaptic uh, neuron. LSD, you can see binding to a 5-HT2A serotonin receptor, which is fascinating uh, and noteworthy. It's a, they, they knew what they were doing when they chose that receptor. Uh, you know, LSD binds to many different receptors in the body. I mean, like over 20 in the brain. Uh, you know, but uh, the 5-HT2A receptor is particularly noteworthy. And that is because LSD is a serotonin or tryptamine-based hallucinogen, meaning that it looks like serotonin, much like psilocybin. However, you also have your phenylethylamine uh, hallucinogens. Both produce visual hallucinations, unlike your NMDA receptor antagonists like ketamine, uh, dextromethorphan, uh, PCP, they produce more auditory hallucinations. So what's the deal with these visual hallucinations between the phenylethylamines, which don't look like serotonin? The tryptamine uh, you know, hallucinogens uh, very much resemble serotonin. The phenylethylamines like MDMA resemble amphetamine and dopamine. They all look very chemically similar. Uh, which makes sense, and they have additional dopamine action. But the phenylethylamines and the tryptamines both show affinity for the 5-HT2A receptor and both produce visual hallucinations. So the 5-HT2A receptor is at least one common denominator between the two that could explain why they both produce visual hallucinations despite uh, being in completely different uh, drug classes based on their chemical structure.